So in my particular battle against anxiety, fear, uh, panic, <laughs> there has been one weapon, one weapon that has proven to be the most effective in me being able to maintain a sound mind and a heart of peace, a spirit of peace. And that is the Word of God. I told you this already for the last couple of weeks. Some of you know this, but for close to 19 uh, years, I have been free of panic attacks. Uh, but in those moments where the enemy still tries to come at me, in those moments when I felt that very, very, very familiar fear and anxiety pressing in on me, it's my speaking out the word that has enabled me to stand firm against the attacks and the strategies of the devil and break free from panic and fear and anxiety. And I believe that that same power is made available to you. It's, I'm not special. God doesn't play favorites. There's nothing special about me. It's been God's word and the proclamation of God's word that has benefited me in that area. And so today what I want to convey to you is the critical importance and the value of God's word in our fight against fear. So I want to start this morning by reading you the, this portion of scripture that describes for us the spiritual armor that God has given to us and its importance in our fight against the enemy. Now, if you don't know it, and many of the verses that I'm going to be sharing with you, I would encourage you, there's a pen in front of you, a little piece of paper, write these down. You can look them up later, but it's so easy to let them be up on the screen and go, oh, that's great. What was that again? In this case, I'm going to be sharing some scriptures that are very, very, very powerful. And so you know, just jot them down, look them later. I would encourage you to do that or don't. Um, it's up to you. So Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. This is our spiritual armor. Listen to this. So Paul says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. Because we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. And so therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil, in the day of evil. It's translated in some Bibles. Then, after the battle, you will be standing firm, so stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil and then put on salvation as your helmet. And take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And what I want to focus our attention on today is what Paul says right there in verse 17. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, of course, every component of the spiritual honor that we just read right now, here in Ephesians chapter 6, is incredibly important. We need each and every piece working together in tandem in order for us to truly be effective in spiritual warfare. You know, you could, to have a shield with no sword, it leaves you with no real way of attacking your enemy or defending yourself. To have a, a shield and a sword but no helmet leaves you vulnerable to, uh, to a strike to the head, which will take you out effectively. And so again, every part of our spiritual armor is necessary and critically important. Therefore, Paul says here, therefore, use all the armor and weaponry that God provides so that you will be able to stand against the deceptive tactics of the enemy. But as important as the shield and the shoes and the helmet and the breastplate and the belt are in spiritual battle, the only offensive weapon that we have in our arsenal is the sword of the spirit, which is defined here for us as the word of God. And so, the question we should ask then is, well, so what exactly is the Word of God? Some of y'all say, well, that's the Bible. And that's true. Now, some of you say, well, the Scriptures say that Jesus is the Word, right? Yeah, and that's true too. But there's actually three Greek words that are used to describe the Word of God. They'll be up here for you, and I'm going to unpack them. We got graphe, logos, and rhema. And I really 
really think that it's important for us to know the distinct differences between each one of these three words because I come to believe that it's our lack of understanding the difference between these three words that have prevented so many Christians from experiencing victory over the attacks of the enemy. And so I hope, I actually prayed this morning um, that you won't tune out of what might seem here in just a moment as a grammar lesson or a vocabulary lesson because, again, I truly believe that when you grasp the difference between these three words, that it can have a dramatic life changing impact on the way that you engage in spiritual battle for the better. And so, please try to stick with me. So, let me, and I'll try to go through them quickly, but, so the first one's easy. Graphe is the first Greek word. And it simply means, as you see up here in Strong's Concordance, it simply means the writings or written thing. It refers to the scriptures, the Bible. Uh, So, when Jesus, in fact, we see this, when he tells the Pharisees here, your mistake is that you don't know the scriptures or to say you don't know the word um, and you don't know the power of God. Well, what he's saying there, if you look at the Greek, is that he's telling them you don't know the graphe, the writings. In fact, he says you know the writings. You think you're finding eternal life in them, but you're missing the point. I am what they're talking about. That is the graphe. And Romans chapter 15, verse 4, it's interesting because you see this word graphe in three different forms. Excuse me, I'm spitting on you. Sorry, Connor. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so you see this word in three different forms. He says this, look, for whatever was written, written long ago, we have proegraphe, for our instruction was written, written agraphe, so that through the encouragement of the scriptures, the graphe, we might have hope. So simply said, graphe is the written word of God. It's the scriptures, it is the Bible, some of which you have in your hands, okay? Then you have the logos. This is defined this way in Strong's Concordance. It's a word spoken by a living voice that embodies a conception or an idea. It's the mental faculty. This is the interesting part of this definition here. Logos is the mental faculty of thinking, meditating, reasoning, calculating. Now, it's this particular aspect of logos, uh, thinking and reasoning, that sets it apart from graphe and rhema, which I'll talk about here in a minute. And I really like how this is made clear here in the International Encyclopedia, uh, the Bible Encyclopedia, where it says this about logos. Thought, thought is probably the best definition for the Greek term logos, since it indicates on the one hand, the faculty of reason, uh, thinking, or the thought inwardly conceived in the mind, And on the other hand, it's that thought outwardly expressed through the vehicle of language. Now, I know that that sounds like, what, Rudy, I'm going to get bored here if you don't start getting to it. I know. Hold on. Please, please. Okay? Because I know that sounds like up here. What does that even mean? Um, But you see this definition up here played out in the manifestation, the incarnation, the coming down from heaven, uh, Jesus in the flesh. Like it says in uh, John chapter 1, verse 1. Look it. In the beginning, it says, in the beginning was the word. The logos is what it says in the Greek. In the beginning was the logos. And the logos was with God. And the logos was God. And then in verse 14, it says that the word, the logos, the the reason, the, the wisdom, the logic, the intention, the truth of God became flesh and dwelt among us. So what it's saying here is that the thoughts of God, what he was thinking, and there was never a time when God was not thinking. He's always been thinking. He's eternal. The the thoughts of God, the intention, the reason of God, became outwardly expressed through his son, Jesus Christ, who is, in fact, the word of God. And so what you have here is you have the graphe, you know, the written word of God, and the logos, which is the reason and the wisdom, the thought, the message, the truth of God, outwardly expressed in the person of Jesus Christ, who is the Word of God. Uh, He is the message that the graphe is communicating and revealing to us. Um, And logos is what or who graphe is communicating. So I hope you see there's a difference there. Written word, all right. 
And then lastly here, and I'm gonna be done with this vocab lesson, okay? <laughs> lastly, you have this word, rhema. And here's how it's defined in Strong's Concordance. Rhema is that which is uttered, spoken by the living voice. It's a thing spoken, a word, speech, discourse. Any sound produced by the voice and having a definite meaning. Rhema is a declaration of one's mind, one's thinking, one re one's reason, made, put into words. Now, if you've been following along here, you might say, wow, this sounds kind of similar to Lagos in some way. In fact, I had to wrestle through this, I spent most of my time wrestling through this. It's important for me to mention to you that there is some contention between Bible teachers and theologians um, between these two words, rhema and logos, because there's folks on one side who are gonna say that there's absolutely no difference between logos and rhema. They're the same thing. It's like saying, hey, I talked to Rudy yesterday or I spoke to little Rudy yesterday. Same thing, there's really no difference. That's what some people would say. But then you have other folks who think that they're really, well, there are similarities, and while they are, you know, they work together, these two words, each one does convey a somewhat different meaning, even if it's only subtle. Now, I spent a, a lot of time doing my own research, reading a lot of incredibly boring articles. Man, I even, I was even reading the writings of Aristotle, uh, who has been, he's been referred to as the pioneer of Western linguistics. Uh, who very, in his writings, which were 350 years before Jesus even stepped on the scene, Aristotle and Plato before him very clearly made a distinction between logos and rhema. And I'm telling you, these cats knew something about Greek. They were. Um, and so I was going to walk you through how I came to agree with those who are on this side who see this nuanced difference between these two words, but I don't want to punish you any more than what you've already experienced right now, okay? <laughs> but this is very, very important, as you'll see in a, mirror, in a minute here. But the, here's the, the conclusion that I've come to is while that these two words do remain some, you know, somewhat inseparable and they do work best, best together, there is a difference between them. Again, even if it is subtle. Aristotle specifically refers to the rhema as spoken words, period. That's just what it says. Look, this is the Encyclopedia of Ancient Greek Language and Linguistics. It's not a Bible study thing. It's just, it's a tool that is used for people who speak Greek. Look, this is from the, this encyclopedia. Rhema is a verb related to both the act and the result of saying something that's very important. It's, Again, rhema is the verb related to both the act and the result of saying something, of what you say. It's, a, it's the word or message um, made active in the present moment that it's spoken out. And let me show you this as, with an example from, from, from the graphe, right? from the written word. Look at what happens when the Apostle Peter shared the message about Jesus with a group of Gentile believers. Okay, this is at the house of Cornelius. It's in the book of Acts chapter 10, verses 42 through 44. But this is, this is, this is the, the rhema in action. So he's re relating to them something. He says, look, Jesus commanded us, me and the other fellows, to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one that God appointed to judge the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him. He's referring to the graphe. They all talk about him. That everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. That is the graphe. Can you feel the difference even as I just say that right now? That everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. There's this very powerful present tense active substance to this declaration of the life-giving message about Jesus. That is rhema. And we know that it's rhema because when you read this text in the Greek language, that's what it says. Everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. And while Peter, it says, while Peter was still speaking these rhema, the Holy Spirit fell on all of those who heard the logos. There's a difference. He spoke out the rhema 
And it was at the same time the logos, the, this word of God that is able to divide between soul and spirit, the invisible realm. That's the rhema at work. The, this word of truth, this message, this logos about Jesus, who is the word, became active in the moment that Peter spoke it out to those who were listening to it. And as they believed it, they heard it, they believed it, the power of the Holy Spirit in that very moment that it fell on them, uh, they received and experienced the reality of what the Word declared. And so, some of you at this point, you're wondering, or you may be hoping, that I'm done with the vocabulary lesson, okay? <laughs> okay. But what I also hope you're wondering is, Rudy, why the distinction? What, who cares? Why does it even matter? And what does this have to do with fighting fear? A lot. So, look, at the beginning of this message, we read Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16. All of, all of Ephesians 6, that first portion, but verse 16. But I want you to see it again now that you have an understanding of what the graphi is versus the logos and the rhema. Here's what it says, Ephesians 6, verse 16. Take up the shield of faith, he says, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Yes. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the rhema of God. The rhema of God. Just some people who carry around their Bible thinking that it has some power in it. Walk in the Bible like, I'm, somehow you have the power of God in you. You see this like on the exorcist, I think. The, that dude had a cross and the a Bible, hey, the power of Christ compels you or whatever he said in that movie. It's like, like it's some like a lucky rabbit's foot, the graphe. You know, good luck with that. You know what happened to that dude in that movie if you watched it, which I wouldn't recommend. <laughs> but <laughs> that's why I'm so jacked up. I had panic attacks. I wonder why. I was watching The Exorcist. Anyway, um, look, um, reading the graphe, the Bible, man, it's incredibly, oh my gosh, it's incredibly important because the graphe is how the truth about Jesus, who is the Logos, is made accessible to us. That's how it's presented to us. The graphe conveys the Logos. See, but it's the speaking of that Logos that becomes the rhema that activates those truths in our life. In fact, that's how we We've been brought to faith in Jesus. Look at this, Romans 10, 17. You've got to look at this stuff sometimes in the Greek or you won't see it. Faith comes from hearing. That is, so faith comes from hearing. That is hearing the rhema, the word spoken about Christ. Faith comes by hearing that. It's the speaking of God's word. It's the profession of God's word that brings about salvation. Look at this, the word, Romans chapter 10, verse 8 and 9. Look at this. The rhema is near you. The word is near you. In your mouth, in your heart. That is the rhema of faith that we proclaim. And then here he goes on to tell you what that rhema is. This, this logos, this rhema truth that's able to bring about salvation. He says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your hearts that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You, can you feel the rhema of that? I can, there's somebody who's watching online who doesn't know nothing about Jesus, or maybe somebody in here. Me just saying that, speaking this rhema over you, you could get saved right now because I just spoke the word rhema over you. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That needs to be spoken out in order for those to hear it, receive it, and then be saved. Boom. Yes, I love that you love that. See, and it's this kind of rhema, it's this kind of word of God that Paul specifically says is our only offensive weapon in this battle against the devil. See, but here is the problem, and when I feel this is such an important message, even at the risk of boring you, um, because of this. And just be honest with yourself. There's no condemnation. But how often... Would you say that you are reading, even just the written word of God, the graphe, really? I mean, be honest. Is the, is the Bible, your Bible, mostly collecting dust 
on your coffee table, or you have a little nice cute space for it in your office, maybe it's on your, in your car, in your trunk, or collecting dust on the shelf. Really, how often is, are you really, really cracking the Bible open? Seriously. Now look, I know, I know some of you. I do know that some of you read the Word of God every day. I know that is one of your habits. I know that. Okay. But those of you who do that, because I hang around with a lot of, I see a lot of people, you are the exception. Because what I know, what most of you know, is that most Christians, for most Christians, reading the graphe just isn't very high on their list of priorities. It's just, that's really true. You know that, right? I mean, I'm not telling you anything you should do. You know that. And I'm not trying to condemn you. It's just trying, we need to admit that and go, yeah, I just really don't. Um, it's easier, you know why? Because it's easier to let somebody else do it. It's easy to let someone else, like me, <laughs> read and study the scriptures, the graphe for them, to present it to them, uh, the Logos, on Sunday, in some way that they can understand it and comprehend it. And, so, and my intent always is that it will hopefully encourage your heart and strengthen your faith and remind you of the truths about Jesus and the, and the hope that we have in him. And that's not a bad thing. But when the day of evil comes, and it will come, the Apostle Paul says, the day, that's what he says, the day of evil, when it comes, and you personally come face to face with fear, panic, anxiety, or any other jacked up evil thing that the enemy brings your way. Think about, is the, the graphe or the logos that you receive secondhand from Charles Stanley or Lisa Turkhurst or Brett Meadow or Rudy Tinoco going to be the weapon that you use to vent yourself against the, the devil's attacks? Forget about it. Now look, hearing the scriptures communicated to you in this form of a message like what I'm sharing with you right now, man, it's a good and valuable thing. I don't want to take away from that, okay? This is a good and valuable thing. You come here to listen to a message that I have prayerfully and very carefully crafted for my own reading and studying of the scriptures, the graphe, and hopefully you leave with a greater understanding of the nature and the character of God and his logos. That's always my intent. But seriously, when it comes to spiritual warfare and the moment when the devil is all up in your grill, really in your face and he's got you cornered overwhelmed with anxiety and fear and maybe even terror and panic man it's not just the scriptures printed on paper that are going to be your line of defense in that moment and it's not going to be your faint recollection of whatever it is that i shared with you on any given sunday morning that's going to be your most effective weapon against the enemy no the bible specifically tells us that we are to take the sword of the spirit, which is the rhema of God. If you want to successfully fight the enemy's tactics of terror, it's not going to be by the word that I know. It's not going to be by the word that your mom knows. It's not going to be by the word that your best friend's always uh, quoting. No. The fight against fear, and that's what this series is about, or, but it's also any other thing that the enemy brings your way is only going to be won by the logos that you know and that the Holy Spirit brings to your remembrance in order that you can speak it out against the lies of the devil, which is really what we're up against at this point. One of the greatest weapons that the enemy uses against us are his lies. It's all about the lies that he tells us and that we listen to and believe over the word of God. And the only way to combat these lies, and this is elementary, we know this, is with the truth. But if you, and I, or I, haven't taken the intentional time and effort to sow God's word into our memory bank and into our heart and into our spirit, how can you really expect to have victory over all of the fierce, deceptive tactics of the enemy? You can't. There's no word in your heart to draw on as your sword to fight with any sense of confidence. You will be jacked. Look, Paul said that, remember he said, I quoted this a little bit ago. Paul said, the word, the rhema is near you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart, he says. But is it 
Really? Most folks might be able to quote John 3.16. I'll give you that. Even non-believers could do that, right? Or maybe they might be able to quote from memory that one verse that says, God only helps, himself, helps themselves. Which ain't even in the Bible. <laughs> That's not even in the Bible. Or maybe they got that one verse that they memorized back in the day in that Bible study that they did, and they kind of clung to that, that one verse that they know. I'll give you that. But I think that there are a lot of Christians who couldn't quote a scripture, chapter, and verse if their life depended on it. And here's the truth of the matter. Our life does depend on it. The enemy, as we've said already a number of times in this series, seeks to steal, kill, and destroy you. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says that our adversary, the devil, he walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he can devour. He wants to kill you, destroy you. That is the truth. But I just think that there's a lot of Christians who aren't really convinced that we're in this life and death battle against the spiritual forces of darkness. I also tend to believe that most Christians don't really, I think it's because they just don't really understand the value and the power or the necessity of memorizing or internalizing the Word of God so that in times of trouble, the Holy Spirit is able to turn that logos that they got up here in the noodle that we have in our mind and use it as a rhema that we can speak out against whatever lie that the devil is sending our way. And so my encouragement to you is, I'm, I'm going to be wrapping this up, okay? My encouragement to you is to determine in your heart that you are going to make the reading of God's word the memorizing, actually, of God's word, a priority in your life. And here's the thing. You don't have to memorize. It sounds overwhelming because you, you just sound like, really? What, what do I memorize? You don't have to memorize hundreds of random scriptures. Look, meditate, meditate on and memorize those verses that are specific to you and that area of your life that is most vulnerable to the enemy's attacks. That's what I've done. I, there's a very specific fight, a sp a very, there's a very specific area that the enemy attacks me at, and he's done it relentlessly for the last, you know, 20, 30 years, he's done this to me. And I was going to share you the story, but I'm not going to do that, but the, the, the scriptures that I memorized wouldn't help you in your battle. They are very, very specific, and there's a lie that I'm trying to always combat through the Word of God. But what are you afraid of? What are you most afraid of? What you need to do is memorize. You might only need 10 verses to deal with the thing that the enemy is coming at you against. Look, and you could take it, you could say, I'm going to just study, meditate on, memorize one verse a week. Man, 10 weeks, that's awesome. You could even be lazier and say, I'll do one verse a month, which is lame sauce, to tell you the truth, because you could probably sing a Chris Stapleton song and know every single word right now but so but if you want to be lazy go ahead and wait, take 10 months one a month you can do that this is doable it is attainable even a monkey could do that for reals um, this is doable we can do this okay um so if you're dealing with anxiety for example because you don't know how you're going to make ends meet that's where you're always struggling it's like man i just i i can't trust god I feel for my finances and we're always struggling and I'm always fearful of not being able to make ends meet. Okay, well, then you got Matthew chapter 6, right? Where you can say, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow or reap or store in barns and look, my father, he takes care of them. You know, how much more does he care about me than these birds? Man, so then you take that and you take Philippians chapter 4 verse 19 and you can say, you know what? In light of that, the fact that I know God, I'm more important to God than these birds, man, I know that God's going to supply all my needs according to his riches in glory in Jesus Christ. Now you got those two verses. You speak that rhema out, and the fear regarding how you're going to provide for your family, it disappears. Just Matthew chapter 6, you can write that down, verse 26. Uh, when you wake up at 3, sometimes, isn't it weird how you wake up at 3 a.m. in the morning? Right? It's weird. Consumed with fear, or maybe it's a night terror. 
you can look at Psalm 91, verses 5 through 7. You say, I'm not going to fear the terror, the, the terror of night, or the arrow that flies by day, or the, the, the plague that stalks in the darkness, or the pestilence, some translations will say, or the, dis- the destruction that ravages at noon. Man, a thousand may fall by my side, another 10,000 by my right side. But it's not going to come by me in the name of Jesus. You can say that at 3 a.m. in the morning and watch the enemy flee. Write that one down. Psalm 51, 5 through 7. Just a couple more here. Are you afraid of being alone? Yeah, look, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. So God, God said, God said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And for that reason, you can have confidence. Saying, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid because he's always with me. I'm not alone. You're not alone. So that fear will dissipate. Write that one down. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 and 6, the last one. Even, Even when that moment, which will inevitably come for all of us, when we are finally, you know, coming toward the end of our journey on this planet, and your heart is filled with fear, you got Psalm 23, verse 4. Even, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, Lord, because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You're speaking the rhema, and the enemy can't handle that. He will flee, because the scriptures say he will. You get my point. You might, again, you might only just need 10 verses to have an effective arsenal of God's word to draw from in your time of trouble. And so focus on one verse a week. Again, or in one month. You can do that. So I hope that you will leave this morning with this renewed conviction of the importance of knowing the Word of God and having it stored in your mind and in your heart and in your spirit. God's Word is a weapon that is available to each one of us, and we can't afford to keep using that tired, old, lame, old excuse that we don't have time. We don't have time not to. 